Today we're going to look at five easy ways to improve this code from a recent code review I did. I called it one of my favorite projects and overall it is very good. However, there are some small things here that could be improved. These are just some general tips that you could probably apply to your own code. And again, they are fairly minor quick tips, but just make sure you're thinking about them. It's important to think about a lot when you're programming in C++. If you want to have a look at the rest of this project that was sent into me, then I'll leave a link to the repository in the description below. Okay, so number one, which probably is the least minor out of all of these tips or improvements is the usage of strings, which I touched on in the original code review, which I will leave linked up there. This code base is using strings as what looks like the type of certain assets. So this is stored in global assets. And then later inside game.cpp, we'll go through the global assets. And how do we retrieve the asset type? Well, it's just the type that we then have to do string comparisons on, which is bad enough, but then we also have to lower it. So in order to remove any case sensitivity, we actually go through and uh, create an entirely new string, transform all of the characters to lower, and then use that to compare against another string to see what asset type we're dealing with and then running the appropriate function. Now, in my opinion, this is crazy because these asset types should just be enums. If we have a look at Hazel, just as an example, then you can see we have all of these asset types listed out here. They're simple uint 16 Ts, which means there's no like copying strings into lowercase characters. There's no comparing strings. There's no possibility of mistyping certain types. They're all just listed out here and you just use them as regular integers that are named. This is one of those win-win low hanging fruit scenarios in which the alternative is cleaner to write, safer to write, because you wouldn't be making typos, and would actually perform better. It's a no-brainer. Now, I will say in this particular context, this is all happening inside the init function, which of course is not that performance sensitive because it's not exactly a hot path. It's not running repeatedly. But obviously, this is just an example of a broader issue in which asset types, which are largely useful in this engine framework are stored as strings, which is bad. Now, another example in this code base where strings are used where they shouldn't be is UI layer. We have this get element function, for example, which takes in a string ID. If we look at the way that it's called, you can see that again, we're just manually typing out light dash container, and then we're getting a child also by just a string, which I guess might be more human readable, but of course you can name variables and IDs and whatever else. And is especially weird because there's a UUID class here. There is a UUID class that generates a universally unique identifier that is a 64-bit integer. Use that. That is what you should be using for all of these IDs where you're trying to get element by an ID. Store those, don't use strings. Strings should really only be used in places that are human interfaceable in the runtime, meaning in the actual application when it's running, not in the code base. In the code base, we wanna be using things that the computer understands best which is not a series of 15 different numbers stored in a human readable string that it then has to process and compare with. No, it's a single number such as a UUID or a 16-bit enum, also fine. You're about to get a whole lot more productive because AI agents have arrived in Notion, the sponsor of this video. Notion is my favorite productivity workspace that I use basically every day for literally everything. And now with the introduction of Notion 3.0, you can work faster with your AI team. This isn't just some AI that can answer your questions and that's it. No, this is a Notion super user that actually does the work. You just assign the tasks and your agent does the work for you. Great for repetitive tasks and automating specific workflows. Let Notion Agent do your work for you by going to my link in the description below. Let me show you how it works. Here's a simple example. I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna ask it to make me a demo page which shows all of the styles and blocks I can use in Notion. And then what it's gonna do is actually make me a page. Okay, so it's created a Notion formatting demo for us, which shows a whole bunch of different blocks, different things that we can do here with Notion, which is really cool. It's even embedded some images for us. Instead of just a simple response, Notion AI will complete tasks for you end to end. Lots of work that I do for Hazel, my game engine, is documented right here in Notion. So I can ask Notion AI to put together a sprint plan for me so I can see what kind of work needs to be done and plan it. And this is the result. You can see it's created this document for me which shows everything that needs to be done. It's created individual sprints with things that are of varying priorities. It's outlined some success metrics for me. Yeah, this is a really cool page that it's put together and you can see it even knows the goal of progressing towards a free public binary release, which is awesome. Now, another thing that it's really useful for is database. 
databases. Databases are a little bit tedious to set up in Notion manually. Just to show you an example, I'll ask it to create a database of my C++ videos from YouTube. And check it out, it's created this page over here with some of my C++ videos inside this database. And of course, this is a great starting point that you can iterate on and add to. So these are just some of the productivity improvements made possible by AI agents in Notion 3.0. Check out my link in the description and give it a go today. Thank you Notion for sponsoring this video. Okay. Moving on to number two, and these are in no particular order, by the way. The rest of these are going to be realistically more minor than that first one, but still things that you should be thinking about, and especially if you want your code to look more pro. Have a look at this render context singleton class. Do you notice things that should be changed. This is the header file. And by the way, not using singletons is not one of the things I had in mind, although that's a story for a different day. Okay. So what are we doing? We're checking to see if instance is not null. If it is, we're returning instance. Otherwise we're creating a new instance and then returning instance. Why is this written this way? A much cleaner way to write this would be if not instance, let's make an instance and then we'll be returning it either way. So the code should just be this. If you really, for whatever reason, want to check if the instance condition is true rather than false, like I am, and by true or false, I just mean, is it null or is it not? Because it is a pointer. So null is going to be zero, which means it would be false. And any other value such as the actual pointer memory address would mean that the Boolean condition is true. In that case, I would at least rewrite it to just get rid of this else block and leave it like this. So we have like an early out. If instance is in fact valid, we can return it. Otherwise we'll create it and then return Turn it. But again, I would just write it like this. Moving down here into the destructor, this is also something that I commonly see with less experienced C++ programmers, and that is not knowing that delete does nothing if the instance is actually null. So in other words, you just do not need this if statement at all. If in fact, this render context instance is null, then this will do nothing. And this is setting it to null, which it already is. And to be honest, I imagine it would be quite a weird edge case where the render context instance would actually be null because obviously the whole purpose of having this in the first place is to have a valid instance. So yeah, just a minor thing, obviously, but it does show that you understand a little bit more about C++ and how delete doesn't do anything if it's null and it's totally safe to call code like this. Now, another quick thing that I noticed that is more of a stylistic choice is having this static instance private in the header file is not something that I would do. I would cut it out completely and just have it be over here inside the CPP file, but have it static so that it's only internal to this translation unit, to the CPP file. This doesn't change the behavior of anything. It just cleans up the header file a little bit. But if you really want to have it in the header file, I would at least mark it as inline static, which is available since C++ 17. And that just removes the need for this at all. And then you would just set it to null pointer to initialize it over here in the header file declaration. But again, I would prefer to just have it here because it keeps the header file cleaner, which is good. This is your like publicly exposed interface into this functionality into this class. Okay. Number three, don't use shared pointers everywhere. In fact, just don't use heap allocation everywhere. For example, inside the input manager, which is the event system, every single time there's like a mouse button event or a key event, like, you know, we're pressing stuff on the keyboard. Every single time that happens, what are we doing? We're making shared pointers and then we're dispatching the event, which means that we're passing that shared pointer, copying it over here into this function and then going through and dispatching it to all of the listeners of this event. Then you can see we're doing a dynamic pointer cast and this is just all things that shouldn't be happening inside your core event system. Instead, just do what Hazel does. If a key press has occurred, we just make a key pressed event like this on the stack and then we pass it into the event callback. Now this eventually would take us into a function such as editor layer on event where we have an event dispatcher which will check for the appropriate event. But again, we're all passing this just by reference. And then here we land into the on key pressed event function and we have our key pressed event. We can do whatever we like with it. It's still derived from event eventually. It's still got that hierarchy, but there's just no reason to create these as heap allocated shared pointers that are reference counted or anything. It's totally fine to create them on the stack and then just pass them by reference everywhere. There are also other events such as the mouse moved event that you can imagine are basically happening every frame. So this in a fairly performance intensive core part of your engine or application would reduce both the overhead of the actual heap allocation, as well as all of the reference counting from the shared point of the atomic increments, the dynamic casting, you don't need any of that. Now, while we are on the topic of shared pointer overhead, let's take a look at number four. I've seen this a lot throughout this code base and that is 
just copying shared pointers all the time. So here we have item item. And if we have a look at what that is, it is a shared pointer. And what are we doing? We're assigning it to an auto variable, which is basically this type over here, just a shared pointer. Why? We're obviously trying to use this as an alias, but we are in fact atomically incrementing the reference count of that shared pointer for no reason. Just stick a reference here. We're just trying to make this code a little bit cleaner by not having to refer to it as item item every time, but we are probably inadvertently introducing that copy and atomic increment, which you should avoid. Here's another example in move system. Again, we've got this item that is a shared pointer and we're just copying it into a brand new variable. You have to be mindful of these shared pointers and copying in general in C++. That's a really important thing to always keep in mind. A good example of this being done properly is inside scene layer stack, where we have all of these layers, which are shared pointers is it's a vector of shared pointer, but what are we doing? We're taking each element here by reference. Very easy to accidentally forget or exclude that, and then you're copying that shared pointer every single time you iterate through one of these layers and using it over here, which you don't need to do. Use the reference like this, and your code literally runs faster. And you're also showing that you understand how this works. Now, if we have a look at a little bit higher, this brings us to number five, our final point. And that is to just be aware of when you pass in raw pointers like this into constructors, and then you're basically intending for this class to sort of have a reference to it, but it's not really a weak pointer. It's not a strong reference. It's just a pointer. And you have no way of actually knowing if that object is still alive, if that memory is still available for you to use. You've kind of just given it access to it, but with no ownership semantics at all. So if we have a look at scene CPP, that's another great example. When we add a render layer, we initialize it with this. So we're passing in this scene, the one that we are currently in into here. And then that is storing it inside this render layers vector. Here it is, raw scene pointers like this into this map of render layers. And then that's kind of it. You're on your own. Is that scene still active? Is it not? This is part of the renderer, which can run independently to the data. You always need to remember to separate your rendering and your data because in more complex setups, they will run independently. Your scene contains all of the actual data that you would like to render, but the renderer might be running like a frame behind on a different thread. It needs access to that data independently and potentially concurrently to the actual scenes being active or deactive or loaded or unloaded. And so having more ownership semantics around that is really important. You could at least have this be like a weak pointer if the original scene was a shared pointer. This may be a little bit tricky to set up because we are in fact passing in this into here and there's no way really to make a shared pointer out of this without intrusive reference counting, which you can do with shared pointers as far as I'm aware. However, Hazel has its own reference counting system and it is intrusive, which means that we can just make an instance of this reference counted object out of this and then pass that to the render thread, for example. And you can, of course, pass that as a strong reference or as a weak reference. But either way, you have the ability of knowing whether or not this scene is actually active, if it's still alive or if it's been deleted, whereas you don't with a pointer. So the point is just to be aware of these ownership transfers and ownership semantics. You always need to be thinking in C++ about who is it that owns my memory, my objects, and how am I passing that around? And how do I wanna deal with them eventually dying? With C++, you really have to look ahead and consider your whole life. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this slightly different format video. Let me know what you thought of all of these improvements in the comment section below. As I mentioned in the original code review, which is linked up there, overall, this project is great. It's one of my favorite it's probably my favorite project out of anything you guys have sent me. But if you have something better or if you have something worse or if you have something that you want me to give you some advice on and review, then send it into channelreview at gmail.com. That email address and some instructions will be in the description below and I might take a look at it next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to hit the like button and I will see you next time. Goodbye.